Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. So we have some kind of wild news. Yeah, like wild to the point where I thought it wasn't real. We have officially hit 50,000 total downloads across our platforms. That's insane. Guys, like, thank what? you so much. Yeah, Holy thank shit. you guys. The podcast is a little over half a year old and we are really proud of what we've done, but we're also just really thankful for the community we've built and for everyone who's given us like an actual chance and listen to us. Yes, thank you very, very, very much. Yeah. But you know what? That's enough cheese because uh, we have an absolutely uh, sickening story for you all today. Yes, we do. Today's tale is the oldest one that we have told to date, but it doesn't make this story any less jaw-dropping. Personally, I think the overall age of this story is something that makes it even more horrifying. It's like the ultimate old-timey crimey. This is the story of desperation, betrayal, and murder unlike anything we've ever talked about before. We are going to be sharing with you the story of Alexander Pierce, an Irish-born man who in the early 1800s was sentenced to serve seven years in a penal colony in what is now Tasmania for the theft of six pairs of shoes. He escaped with a group of other prisoners into the treacherous lands off of Sarah Island. He was the only one that would survive. When he was caught, he told a story of betrayal and cannibalism that was so shocking they thought he was making it up. They just didn't believe someone could be capable of such evil. That is, until he escaped a second time and did it all over again. This episode comes with a bit of a warning, so grab a blanket and some tea because we are in for one hell of a story. But before we start, we have a quick favor to ask of you. So whatever platform you are listening on, please make sure you're following us and you have those notifications turned on. Also, if you do have a chance to leave us a like, comment, or a review, we would really appreciate that too. Especially if it is a five-star Spotify review, those are the bomb.com friends. We must do these things in order to please the almighty algorithm gods, which is stupid, but it really does help us grow, so please and thank you, dear listeners. All right, are you ready for this one? As ready as I'll ever be. Normally, we like to start episodes like this by talking about the early life of our subject. But the thing about Alexander Pierce is that we don't really know a whole lot about his early life or the kind of person he was before all of this happened. So we're going to be spending a bit of time talking about some of the history of the area he was sent to. What we do know about him is that he was born sometime in 1790 in County Monaghan, Ireland, where he worked as a farm laborer. And I looked up County Monaghan because I had absolutely zero knowledge about the area prior to this. And their Wikipedia page has a huge list of notable people that are from there. And they definitely left out Alexander Pierce. I, I can't say I blame them, but like, Ireland would be so cool oh, to visit. I would love to go one day. Oh absolutely. my god, so pretty. When he was 30 years old, he was charged for the theft of the six pairs of shoes. He was tried in nearby County Armagh and was sentenced to serve seven years in a penal colony in Van Diemen's Land, which is now modern-day Tasmania, and I feel like that name was very appropriate. Oh, just wait, friends. It seems like the closest thing to a photo of him that exists was a sketch that was made of his head after his execution. So I'm sure that was an incredible likeness of his. Just lovely. We do know that he stood around five foot four inches and had blonde hair, his skin was described as pockmarked, and his eyes were either blue or hazel, depending on the source. I really doubt anyone was super willing to look deeply in his eyes and find out the color. Probably not. We're pretty sure most of you are aware that parts of Australia served as penal colonies hundreds of years ago, but we wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about the history there. I don't know about you, Charlotte, but I find this kind of history absolutely fascinating. And I wanted to share it because I think it's obviously a huge part of this story, but I also wanted to make sure everyone got a solid picture of where he was sent to for, again, stealing six pairs of shoes. Well, it's pretty wild because people would be sent to the penal colonies for all sorts of crimes. And like with Mr. Pierce, some of the crimes were relatively small and kind of insignificant. The other thing here that's pretty wild is just how far he had to travel to get there. Ireland and Australia are roughly 15,000 kilometers apart. That's about 9,600 miles. So between 1788 and 1868, around 16,200 British and Irish convicts were shipped to various penal colonies throughout Australia. The colonies were built by the British in an effort to stop the French from expanding into that area. The first of many fleets of ships arrived in Sydney in 1788. I can't. Can you imagine that trip? Because I can't awful. imagine it. Oh, oh my god. That's so far. 
The amount of people who must have died on the way was probably huge. So why did the Brits send so many convicts so far away? Because it seems almost more like more trouble than it's worth. Essentially, they ran out of space for them. By the 1770s, there were 222 official crimes in Britain that carried a death penalty. Some of these offenses were things like stealing an animal, cutting down a tree, and theft over five shillings. I may or may not have found a new fascination of mine while researching this episode, because I'll admit I really didn't know a ton about early British penal history, but like, <laughs> I want to do more episodes where we get to talk about this because I find it really interesting and I really hope you guys do too. If anyone listening knows any like books or documentaries that you think we might like that are kind of up this alley, please let us know. Yeah, absolutely. So essentially at the time they didn't have things like prisons. If you committed crimes, you were executed more or less. It's really as simple as that. It was less expensive and for funsies, it keeps the population down. It's true. So for those who remained, it definitely served as a deterrent. The British were trying to get away from this because the public clearly didn't like the idea of their lives ending due to a petty crime. So they began incarcerating people and saving executions for things like murder and serious assault. This meant that the prison populations were at an all-time high. Life in these places was an absolute hell filled with poor nutrition, awful living conditions, and regular lashings. Sentencing someone to penal transport was seen as a compromise. Rather than execute people for petty crimes, they would be sent away to these various colonies. So don't get us wrong, these places were not exactly any better than the British prisons. They were just further out of the way. All of this essentially meant that men, women, and children could be sent away for things as small as stealing food, which is better than being executed, I guess, but that's still pretty extreme. Yeah, you heard that right. There were kids too. I, I feel like um, if anybody is familiar with the works of uh, Charles Dickens, it comes up a lot. Like, even if you're familiar with, like, Oliver Twist or, like, Great Expectations, that's, like, a big part of these uh, stories is, like, how brutal the punishment was for, like, child pickpockets, for example. Like, they'd be sent off or hung, too, so... Honestly, it was brutal, and that was something that surprised me, like, the fact that it was 222 different crimes. Like, yeah. how can you name 222 crimes? Ex like Not without getting real specific right? about like, it. Like, I looked at a man the wrong way and now they're executing me. Like, that's what it sounds like to me. Pretty much. Some of the people who were sentenced did their time and returned home, while others chose to settle in the area and start completely new lives. Apparently for quite a while, it was considered a great shame to be a convict or to come from convict ancestry, but today it's often celebrated. Yeah, if we have any Australian listeners, we'd love to know if you shoot us an email at thegrimcurriculum at gmail.com we would love to hear if you've got any family members that have this history or whatever do you know anyone who has the yeah. history like, we're curious we do know that apparently quite a few ex-convicts found prominent positions throughout society and they did pretty well for themselves which is good considering how many of them were there for what most would consider smaller crimes and also a random fun fact the man who drew the picture of his head after he was executed was actually a famous ex-convict who became a well-known painter of portraits for people. Fun fact. Yeah. All of that doesn't mean that there weren't people who committed more serious offenses. There absolutely were. It was just a lot more likely that someone convicted of serious assault or murder would have already been executed rather than being sent away. By the time Alexander Pierce was sentenced to seven years at one of these colonies, they'd been around for quite some time. Over the years, they'd grown in size and new ones were being built to hold the increasing amount of prisoners being sent to that area. One of these was the Macquarie Harbour Penal Colony, which was on Sarah Island. It was considered by far the most harsh of all of the colonies. Many of the convicts that were sent there had committed more serious crimes, while others were just deemed escape risks or difficult to deal with. It's a pretty small piece of land, so it's only about 20 acres. However, the trees that grew there were used for building ships, and it was quickly seen that this could be taken advantage of. Multiple spots for shipbuilding were constructed. All they needed was the labor. This essentially made it so that not only were you sent there if you were deemed difficult, you could also be sent there if you had the skills to help with the shipbuilding that needed to be done. Essentially, there was a lot of money that could be made and a lot of people they could force to work. The area was ideal for something like this. 
It was hundreds of miles away from any other settlements, and it was separated by large and treacherous rivers as well as large mountainous areas and forests. One of the closest spots where others could be found was Grummet Island, which was where people were sent for solitary confinement. The only access to the sea from here was through a narrow channel known as Hell's Gates. Those who did try and escape were more than likely to drown due to the strong tidal currents. And if you didn't drown, it was also likely that you could be eaten by one of the many different types of sharks that called that area home. Anyone who escaped would have had to make their way off of the island and across the harbor. If they were able to do that without dying, they were greeted by vast rainforests that they would have to cut their way through. Sarah Island unfortunately didn't really produce anything that could be eaten by humans, and there wasn't a ton of animal life on the island either. So if you didn't die by drowning or by shark, it was most likely that you would simply starve to death or succumb to the elements. It must sound crazy that someone would be willing to escape when their odds were so low. However, when you look at what they were experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis, you kind of can't blame them for trying. They really didn't have anything to lose by trying to escape. Life for the average prisoner in one of these penal colonies, especially Sarah Island, was absolutely horrific. Like we mentioned, food didn't really grow there. Malnutrition was common along with illnesses like scurvy and dysentery. Food had to be brought in by ship, which meant that what they ate was usually stale and it provided a poor amount of nutrients. Man, it would have been shitty to even be like the warden or the guards at this kind of establishment. That's the thing that I kept reading. It was that like the prisoners were miserable, the guards were miserable, yeah. like everyone hated it. It, was t it wasn't somewhere that anyone wanted to be. No. Like, it was bad, especially Macquarie Island. Punishments were harsh and frequent. Like we mentioned, solitary confinement was a common practice. Prisoners were subjected to regular floggings, oftentimes done by their peers. Sometimes this would be a position that they would volunteer for. Other times it was done by threat of further punishment. They were often flogged themselves if they didn't hit the men hard enough. The majority of these prisoners were subjected to straight up torture on a regular basis. And keep in mind, it could have been for something as petty as pickpocketing. It like theft of five shillings for a lot yeah. of it like which in the, back in those days was a fair amount of money but not hundreds of thousands of no dollars. no this was like someone stole five potatoes and now their life is hell literally you, like pickpocket stealing an apple in 1823 alone the prisoners were sentenced to a combined amount of 9100 lashes jesus and if life wasn't bad enough while they were awake Things were even awful when they tried to sleep. The population boom in Britain caused these places to quickly become overcrowded. It's said that at one point conditions were so bad due to overcrowding that prisoners weren't even able to sleep on their backs. They were forced to sleep side by side with one another. Things were so bad that a few years after Alexander Pierce arrived, there was another prisoner that actually stabbed someone just so they would execute him. He decided he would rather take a life and die than live one more day in such terrible conditions. This place had a reputation for being hell on earth and it certainly deserved that title. That was actually the main reason that this particular colony was only kept open for 11 years. A total of 112 convicts escaped Sarah Island. 62 of them died during their attempt, and 9 of them were murdered by a fellow convict. It's also interesting to note that the 4 men who escaped were later found and recaptured all the way in South America. Which, good for them. I feel like, like there has to be some kind of, like, once you get past a point, you're, like, home free, you know? I like, think especially back then. If these kind of stories interest you, please let us know in the comments or on social media, because we really want to cover more like this. Now, we know we just went through a lot of information without even mentioning the lovely Alexander Pierce, but we felt it was important to share because it makes the fact he managed to escape and survive not once, but twice so much more impressive. It's also important to mention that out of those nine men who were murdered, eight of them were with Pierce around the time of their deaths. When we last left Alexander Pierce, he had been sentenced to serve seven years for the theft of six pairs of shoes. He very quickly gained a reputation as a troublemaker on the island. Early records show that he was originally sent to another colony at first, but was shipped to Sarah Island due to his behavior. He got in trouble for stealing a wheelbarrow. What a rebel. He also stole three ducks and two turkeys, and he was sentenced to 25 lashes for this. I wonder if he stole the wheelbarrow so he could cut around his turkeys and ducks. I don't get the point of stealing the wheelbarrow when you're in prison. 
prison. To, I almost <laughs> wonder, you wonder if he was doing it just to like take the piss. Honestly, I think at this point he was probably just trying to piss people off. I think so. There were a few other charges there too for him, including being drunk and disorderly numerous times. For this, he received 50 additional lashes. Also, Ow. how did he get alcohol in prison? Oh, they were getting drunk. Because that's the thing. That's the thing. These were not prisons, like traditional prisons. I guess, like yeah. it was a colony, right? So like they had the areas where like the, the prisoners slept and they were kept and all of that. But like they had a little bit more freedom to walk around. Like not mm. completely, but they were moved from place to place. And I think with like all of the different like areas that they were working when they were building ships, it was probably easy to like either well, steal alcohol or make it I mean you can make Pruno in a toilet, right? It's so. true. And plus the other thing is too is that um people back then did drink beer a lot because it was safer than drinking water. Yep. It's true. So maybe Especially there. It could very well have been part of their like daily rations, right? Here's your loaf of bread and your, your Mug beer. Of ale, I guess. Like I, I don't really know. Like we said, these lashes were often done by other prisoners who were threatened with punishment if they didn't lash them hard enough. So that meant that these punishments were severe and they left wounds that often got infected and took a really long time to heal. Yeah, and this wasn't exactly a place where you wanted to have giant open wounds. So he actually made three known escape attempts at this time. In May of 1822, he ran off into the woods where he remained until he was captured by guards. A 10 pound reward was offered for his arrest and we actually still have records of this. The Hobart Town Gazette reported, A. Pierce, a convict, number 102, charged with diverse misdemeanors, is five foot three quarter inches high, brown hair, hazel eyes, and aged 30 years. A laborer tried in Armagh in 1819, sentenced seven years, arrived in this colony in the Castle Forbes in 1820, born in the county of Monaghan, and is pock-picked. When he was caught, he was charged with absconding and forging an order. This, along with the crimes of theft, earned him a reputation as a very difficult convict. Essentially, when he escaped the first couple of times, they were annoyed but kept sending him back. But after the third time, they were done dealing with his shenanigans. Apparently, it was like the people who like served and just stayed there and lived there that were like super annoyed with him because mm. the first few times he like ran away and he started like harassing like the townspeople that lived there. And they're probably like, "Buddy, we served our time. Yeah, and now we're trying to live our peaceful little lives." They probably didn't take too kindly to that. I can imagine why. Because of all of this, he was sent to Sarah Island for the remainder of his sentence, where he was due to face even more harsh punishments along with the other prisoners there. We spoke about how badly the convicts were treated, but it was nothing compared to life on Sarah Island. Even the guards there were absolutely miserable. It really wasn't somewhere that anyone wanted to be. The isolation is what made it so bad. It was difficult to get proper food and supplies shipped there. The weather was also dreadful and hit both hot and cold extremes between day and night. Alexander Pierce had been on the island for about six weeks. He and seven other men had been assigned to a long day of chopping down trees. Which, like, think about how awful that would be in the Australian heat. Like, especially when you don't have proper food and you're essentially being, like, beaten on a regular basis. No kidding. Not to mention the bugs, the infections you're probably getting from the lashes. Australian snakes. Like, Absolutely. Ugh, there's there's scary. some critters. On September 20th, 1822, Alexander, along with John Mather, Robert Greenhill, Edward Brown, Matthew Travers, William Kennerly, Thomas Bodenham, and Alexander Dalton decided they had had enough of the brutal punishments. The men agreed that it was time to plan an escape. The idea was to gang up on the overseer and steal a nearby whaling boat. They would then travel towards the Pacific and they planned to end up somewhere near China. Which in itself seems like a pretty difficult thing to do. Yeah, so to give you guys an idea of that, that's like 7,400 kilometers away. This either shows us that their men were naive and had no clue what they were actually in for, but it more than likely just shows how absolutely desperate they were. It's more likely that at this point, anything was better than life on Sarah Island as a convict. Unfortunately, things didn't go as planned and the men made a last minute decision to make a run for it into the bush. 
This could not have been a worse idea. This is some of the most treacherous land in the world. Like we mentioned before, there really wasn't anything that grew there that was worth eating, and the men had essentially no supplies of their own. Even nowadays, this area is considered one of the most difficult in the entire world to traverse. The only people brave enough to attempt to hike through it are usually experienced bushwalkers who have high-end equipment. So you can imagine just how ill-equipped Alexander and the other men were. Not to mention they were likely already malnourished and possibly suffering from various injuries. The thing to remember is that not only was the area essentially filled with things that wanted to kill them and not help keep them alive, it was also incredibly far away from any towns or settlements. If they wanted to survive, they were looking at a 225 kilometer journey. The men attempted to hunt and forage, but there was simply nothing around that could sustain them. Hunger quickly became a huge problem, and with this kind of hunger comes desperation. Robert Greenhill was the one who had the axe when they escaped and he appointed himself as the leader. Him and Matthew Travers were on Sarah Island because they had stolen another boat in an attempt to escape. They trekked east for about two weeks. The men were physically exhausted and they were starving. It was then that they decided that the only way to survive was to kill one of the other men and feast on his flesh. This is where things get a little foggy because the only survivor was obviously Alexander Pierce. He was the only one left to tell the story, so that is what we have to go off of. As for what actually happened, there are a few different versions, but as always, we've done our best to clear things up. Some reports say that the men drew straws to see who would be the first to die. It's said that Alexander Dalton drew the shortest straw. Other sources say that the men unanimously chose him due to the fact that back at the camp, he had volunteered to be a flogger. Since all of these men had been subjected to violent beatings, they despised those who actually volunteered to do it. It is said that then the men butchered Dalton and ate his flesh. The following day, Edward Brown and William Kennerly noped the fuck out of there and returned to Sarah Island to face their punishment. Yeah, I, I feel like at that point, they're like, all right, fellas, you know, we have uh, royally fucked it up. Yeah, they're like, that's enough. This is not going well. We are out of here. And I want to take a quick second just to point something out, if you don't mind, Charlotte. Yeah, of course. Um, so a lot of sources actually say that Dalton had gone with them, but that he died of exhaustion and was left behind. And that's clearly not what we just said. Brown and Kennerly, they made it back without him, and they said that's what happened. They later died in a medical center. When Pierce was later captured, he said that not only did they kill Dalton and eat him, but that Brown and Kennerly had eaten him too shortly before they left. They said they left because they didn't agree with the actions of the group. However, it's possible that they also engaged in cannibalism due to the sheer desperation and that they changed the story afterwards to save face because the fact that the other men were eaten leads me to personally believe that they were as much a part of it as everyone else, but that's speculation on my part based on like what little information we do have. It wouldn't surprise me because it's not the only time in history that desperate men have turned to cannibalism. If anyone's familiar with the book The Heart of the Sea, which is the true story that Moby Dick is based off of, the men are forced to turn to cannibalism to survive when their whaling ship is sunk by a whale, and though some of them survive, they don't admit what they did to survive until much, much later because they were ashamed of it. Well, I think like there's survivor's guilt, and then there's like, I survived because I ate everyone guilt. It's hard to know the truth about what actually happened to a group of men when only one of them actually survived. While it may seem that this entire escape was a total disaster, and so far it kind of was, there were some parts of it that were actually quite impressive. Greenhill was probably the right man to choose as their leader due to the fact that he had spent the majority of his life working as a sailor. The men had no maps and no compass, but they were able to use the sun and the stars to navigate and go almost completely east in the right direction. They trekked on for 42 days. As they continued, the hunger grew stronger. Eating Dalton hadn't sustained them for very long. We're about to get a little gross here for a second. Uh, it's important though. Let's talk a little bit about what actually happens when you eat human flesh, Charlotte. So, as it turns out, humans actually don't make for the best food. According to reports made by those who have actually eaten human flesh, we are similar to a kind of blend between fish and pork. We also contain a fair bit of protein in our flesh, but the meat does not have a ton of carbs. What that means is that when the men killed and ate Dalton, they were hungry again very quickly. This wasn't a situation of them killing him and carrying on for a while to safety. 
they learned very quickly that in order to survive, they would have to do it all over again and it would have to be soon. We aren't quite sure what happened to the other men or the order they were killed in. What we do know is that after five weeks of agony and constant walking, only three men remained. Alexander Pierce, Robert Greenhill, and Matthew Travers. Since Greenhill was the leader, it's said that the majority of the murders were actually done by him. Like we mentioned earlier, when they escaped, he still had the axe from chopping down trees. And that's most likely how the men were killed. At first, the men were butchered. Those who remained would start a fire, cook the flesh, and the insides of their victim. Eventually, all of that was thrown out the window, and the men were eaten raw. It is said that they chose the weakest men first and went from there. It's likely that one of the men was killed simply because he could not swim and he was slowing everybody else down. By this point, the land that they were on was actually much easier to trek through. However, they were still incredibly ill-prepared and had no way to actually live off of the land. Greenhill and Travers were fairly good friends at this point. Like we mentioned before, they had earned themselves a trip to the island because of a theft they committed together. At this point, it must have seemed to Alexander Pierce like he was going to be the next one to die. After all, would Robert Greenhill rather kill him or a man that he considered to be his friend? Well, luckily for Pierce, and very unluckily for Travers, the area was filled with snakes like because th Australia. That's the thing to keep remembering here. Like, they weren't just trekking through anywhere. This is rural Australia where there's a ton of venomous animals and things just waiting. They're just waiting to kill you. A tiger snake had bitten Travers on the foot. This was a venomous bite and caused him an extreme amount of pain. The foot quickly became gangrenous and Travers had to be carried and dragged by the other men. They actually did this for him for five whole days until Travers actually begged them to kill him. The agony had become way too much for him to bear. Based on the possibility that they killed one of their other uh, clan members because he couldn't swim, I'm really surprised that they dragged him for five days. And I think that says a lot about how much Green Hill cared for him because yeah. I think if it was like any other guy that got bitten on the foot, he would have been like, okay, bye. Oh, too bad, so sad. But they, I mean, the fact that they dragged the guy and they're already malnourished. Oh, yeah. So they, he cared about him for sure. Matthew Travers was most likely killed in his sleep. Robert Greenhill and Alexander Pierce ate his flesh raw. So, as we've established, uh, not only is human meat far from the best thing to be eating, for multiple reasons in this case, they ate Travers after he had been bitten by a venomous snake and had probably been riddled with sepsis and gangrene, and they weren't even bothering to cook him either, so that's mm. Mm, yummy. Oh, like, this whole thing, this is the thing, the story, the word that kept coming to mind for me, gross. Absolutely. I'm, I'm genuinely surprised, again, because this story is just shocking any way you pour it. I'm surprised uh, Greenhill and Alexander Pierce didn't suffer some kind of hardcore illness due to eating someone who had been infected with snake venom. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure, you know what, because we're going to see how this all goes, but I'm sure if, if they had lasted much longer, that would have upset their tummies a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And then there were two. This entire thing in a group must have been beyond horrifying, but the idea of two men out to get one another is almost beyond imagination. Like, the tension here. The words cat and mouse were described a lot while talking about this. There's a movie about all of this called The Last Confession of Alexander Pierce from 2008 that describes all of this really, really well, like this part in particular. The movie itself, pretty slow build. It's really dark, as in the movie is like just really poorly lit. So it's a little hard to watch, but it really lends to the whole like desperation and dreariness of it all. But these two together, afraid to even go to sleep because the other might kill them, is like something out of a survival horror movie to me. Well, they were so afraid of one another that they could not sleep at this point. They both knew that they were stuck with a man who was starving, uh, capable of murder, and absolutely gonna eat you because they were so desperate. We know we keep using that word a lot. Desperate. But that's because that's exactly what this was. This is probably as utterly hopeless and terrible as it can get. In their minds, they've escaped what many will consider hell on earth, but now they've had to kill and eat their buddies, so now it's eat or be eaten. This entire story reminds me of The Donner Party, Very which so. is one of my favorite survival stories of all time. I've done little mini presentations on it back in the day on Twitch, but it's one I'm really, really, really eager to cover here. I've been slowly doing my reading and <laughs> compiling stuff for a future episode, and I can't wait, because these, honestly, like... Sh 
these survival tales, like the old timey survival tales, we were saying this before we started recording, but like they're insane. Insane. And I think it's because in the modern age with all the technology and, and the comforts we have now, um, it's almost a whole, like imagining a fantasy world. A hundred percent. Especially because like people aren't tough like this anymore. No, no, no. They built different back oh, in the day. Oh, very different. Like we mentioned, the men were so afraid of each other that sleep was not even an option. But when you're already malnourished and exhausted, you really can't avoid it. Unfortunately for Robert Greenhill, he was the first to doze off. Alexander saw that the man had fallen asleep and almost immediately went for his axe and swung it at his head, killing him instantly. He ate him and kept some of the pieces of flesh with him as he traveled. Eventually, he was able to travel far enough to find other people, first some indigenous settlements and then various sheep farms. He made his way to a settled area where an ex-convict sheep herder helped him. This man helped him get some food and clothing and likely offered him a place to sleep for a little while. Some sources say that this man was actually known to him and that he spotted him eating a lamb that he had just stolen when he offered to help. And I just picture Alexander Pierce all dirty and covered in blood eating a lamb raw while his buddy walks up to him and he's like, Hey Alex, you all right there, bud? I just like, I'm surprised. I mean, I'm not sure what the firearm situation would have been in those days, but I'm surprised that the sheep farmer didn't like shoot first, ask questions later, to be honest, because... If I caught a feral convict snacking on my livestock, livestock, sorry, raw, I I don't know that I would have had any sympathy for Gollum. It, it's this like image of him hunched over eating a, like a fucking baby lamb, Ugh. and there's just blood on his face, no. and he looks up at him, and he's like, Argh. no, it's brutal. I don't like it. During this time, life was still pretty rough for Alexander, but even compared to what he had just been through, this place must have been paradise compared to living off the land. He spent the majority of his time here robbing farms, stealing sheep, and committing petty crimes. Eventually, he became involved in a big sheep stealing operation and was caught with two other men. They were both executed. At this point, he had spent over 100 days on the run. When he returned to Hobart, he faced punishment for the escape. They did not hang him for the murders, though. And this part is actually kind of wild, and that's saying a lot considering everything we've already yeah, talked what about. what we've already discussed. So, he was taken to the authorities to give an account of what happened to him and the other men. The man who he told the story to, along with Reverend Robert Knopwood, heard the story and immediately thought he was making it all up. They figured that the men had escaped together and they had all gotten away except for Alexander, who was covering for them. He told them that the men had been killed and that he had engaged in cannibalism multiple times in order to survive. They absolutely refused to believe this story and sent him back to continue serving his time. All in all, Pierce gave three different confessions. One was at this time, another would be later, and a final confession would be given right before his execution. As we stated before, the story would change here and there, but overall it was pretty consistent. He was returned to Sarah Island shortly after his capture, but it seems like he was a man who simply could not stay out of trouble. And this is where we're going to introduce his final victim, the unfortunate Thomas Cox. Thomas had heard about Alexander's claims of cannibalism, but the main thing he took away from it was that he had escaped and he survived. So he did something incredibly questionable. He convinced the recently captured cannibal to escape again, and this time, he wanted to come with him. Thomas, no! This guy has literally straight up told you he ate people! Like, apparently Thomas actually asked him numerous times, and he'd bring it up again and oh again God. and was, again. Was Thomas young? Because I'm feeling like his frontal lobe was not developed. He was very young. Oh, poor Thomas. He was very, very young. Uh, so, Alexander Pierce, he didn't want to leave again. But when he was presented with an opportunity, he took it just like he did many times before. It's really interesting, actually, because the guards and people in charge refused to believe him. But when it came to the prisoners, he was seen as a hero. He had escaped, and now he was about to do it again. And unfortunately for Thomas, 
He was going to go with him. Okay, so why why the hell would Thomas want to do that? There could be a few different reasons. Uh, like I mentioned, he was substantially younger than Pierce, so he could have just been really naive. Oh. Although, it's hard to get past the idea that he thought the guy who ate every man he escaped with last time wouldn't eat him too. Maybe he thought that their plan was better and that they wouldn't end up in the same situation as the last team did. Either way, things did not end well for Thomas Cox. And this is where we start to ask some serious questions about Mr. Pierce here. At this point, we know that he's murdered at least one person, Greenhill. The other men were most likely not killed by him, but he still did participate in eating them. One can argue that this doesn't make Alexander Pierce an evil man, but a man who did what he had to do in order to survive. Is it right? No, but what other choice did he have? His second big escape paints a very different picture, not that of a desperate man, but one who is filled with rage. We don't know a lot about this second escape other than it only lasted about 11 days. Once again, only Alexander Pierce remained when he was captured. This time, guards found pieces of Thomas Cox's flesh in his pockets. Amongst that, they found a fair bit of other food. This proved two things. One, he wasn't lying when he said he had eaten the other men. And two, Alexander Pierce did not kill Thomas Cox to survive. When questioned by the guards this time, he told them that he killed Cox in a rage because he found out that the man couldn't swim. When they asked about the flesh, he told them that he preferred human meat. So there you go. Thank you so much, Alexander. Thank you for sharing, you Alexander. All wow. For us. I don't agree with anything he did prior to killing Cox by any means, but at the end of the day, he did what he thought he needed to do to survive. So it is what it is. He was somewhere with absolutely zero food and he was starving, but this just seems like he killed him to save himself because he thought Cox would either drown anyway or would be the reason that he got captured. This time, people actually believed his story. I'm still in shock that they didn't believe him the first time. I mean, it is pretty mind-blowing and I, mean, I think people were just like, no, no. We don't do things like that. We don't eat people. In the early 1800s, something like this was beyond imagination. Like, it was hard to even fathom that a man could kill and eat multiple people. Uh, to be fair, I think uh, this would also be something people would have trouble coming to terms with even now. Exactly. And that's the thing with this kind of stuff. Not only do you have the crime of murder, which most would argue is the worst crime of all, but you also have the desecration of a corpse in one of the worst possible ways. In a lot of ways, to me at least, this is the ultimate crime, so it's not hard to see why something like this is really difficult for people to accept. Since they believed him this time, it was time for him to face his punishment. Now, it was for much more than just an escape. Alexander Pierce was facing trial, and if found guilty, he would be put to death. When it comes to the trial, the thing to remember is at this point, they were still executing people for murder on a very regular basis. This wasn't like an innocent until proven guilty kind of approach. It was more of a formality. We don't know a ton about the trial, but we were lucky to find a few witness accounts. The trial took place on June 20th, 1824, which in Australia was the middle of winter. The courtroom was freezing and a huge blizzard had occurred recently, covering everything in a thick coat of snow. We do want to specify that this trial was only for the murder of Thomas Cox and that he was never actually tried for the deaths of the other men. The judge presiding over the case was John Luz Petter. He was known for taking his job very seriously and often examining evidence and testimony in great detail. He was also known to show little pity for those who stood before him and often reminded them that literally everyone knew what the punishments were and that the crimes were committed with that knowledge. The prosecutor was Attorney General Joseph Tice Gellibrand. Apparently this guy actually died a little over a decade later because he got lost while in the bush. Reports say that he was murdered and that it was most likely that he was killed by an indigenous tribe. Which, like, don't go out into the bush. Honestly, you like, guys. And scary. also just leave people alone. Lee, okay, yeah, that too. What Maybe, business just... did he have marching through the Australian outback in the 1800s? Right, that's true. What were you doing, Joseph? So unfortunately for him, Alexander Pierce was given no one to represent him, not that it would have helped anyway. Yeah, there's no way he stood a chance at all at his trial. By the time all of this had happened, word had spread all the way to Britain and even in the U.S., 
There were a lot of eyes on those in charge and everyone wanted to make an example of Piers. Especially considering they didn't exactly handle things right the first time he was captured. Yeah, that's not a good look for anyone. Piers not having representation means that there's no record of anything he said during his trial, which sucks for us because it would have been interesting to hear more of his words on the matter. We have one known quote, which we will share later. The trial was very short, and we do have some witness reports that tell us that he gave himself up because he knew that he would never really escape. In regards to the murder of Thomas Cox, he said that he was horror-struck at his own conduct and that he was remorseful. Other reports say that he did show some signs of repentance and that he felt guilt for the things that he had done. He was found guilty and was sentenced to hang until he was dead. Something that was uncommon about his death was that it was ordered for his body to be dissected and studied. This was not something that was done often, especially not to prisoners, but people wanted to study him to ideally understand what caused him to do the things he did. On July 19th, 1824, Alexander Pierce was led to the gallows at the Hobart Town Jail. He was read his final rites by Father Philip Connolly and was hanged shortly after. It's reported that shortly before his execution, he said, Man's flesh is delicious. It tastes far better than fish or pork. That's a very Albert Fish sounding quote. Oh, that's someone we gotta cover. Yeah, absolutely. But damn, brutal quote, Alexander. Yeah, geez. Um, pretty brutal considering in court you said that you were repentant and remorseful and then you're like, yeah, but... It's good, though. That's why I wish we had more of the court reports, because, like, all, like, Baba Anyuka is the best example. Because, oh, yeah. like, those court she transcripts set the change record straight. everything. Yeah. And if you look at that case without looking at the court transcripts, it's a completely different story. Very much so. So I feel like this, like, oh, to be a fly on that Australian court wall. In the middle of the blizzard. Yep. The body of Alexander Pierce was sent to the Hobart Hospital where he was dissected. His skull is now held at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. And his skull went through a whole journey itself. We've seen this a few times before, and actually I was listening to a different true crime podcast today, and their story also had a skull that went missing. Damn! It happens a lot, apparently. At least the skull didn't get lost like they did in some of the other cases we've covered. Shout out to our Hinterkaifex series. Go listen to that if you haven't already. And even if you've already heard it, it's a gooder. So go and listen again. Yeah, do it. So yeah, his skull. Apparently, it was originally sold by a surgeon to an American phrenologist named Samuel George Morton. Phrenology being the study of the shape of a human's head to determine their mental abilities or even personality traits. So it would make sense why he would want this head for his collection of heads. I don't even know what to call it. Like, early medicine is horrifying. Wild. Just a bunch of doctors with their head collections and their cocaine injections and their jars of leeches. So in 1953, Morton gave his collection over to the Academy of Natural Science in Philadelphia, who then gave the skull of Alexander Pierce, along with a bunch of other unnamed skulls, to the museum where, like we said, it stayed to this day. Do you think Morton just got, like, the ick one day? He, like, walked into his collection room and he was like, Gah, what have I done? Honestly, he probably walked into the room and was like, Samuel, how did we get here? Yeah, probably. <laughs> This has become a problem. You know, today people collect uh, like amiibos and pop figures and Samuel was out here collecting people's heads. Hey, you know what? Whatever floats your boat or finds your remote, man. Gotta catch them all. Oh my god. Yeah, but with human beings, that's so much more threatening. <laughs> As for Sarah Island, it's now a historic site that operates under the Tasmania Parks and Wildlife Service. And I, I know I say this a lot and I tell you guys to look stuff up on Google Maps a lot, but look this up. Because it gives you an idea of just how isolated the area is. And you can even actually see the old prison ruins. It's really cool. The remains of the solitary confinement cells are still there. And you can find really, really good pictures of them. But damn, they're horrifying. Yeah. I, I also, like, when I'm listening to a case or a story and they're explaining, like, where it is and everything, I like to look and see so I can, like, picture how it's happening Me too. I like being so, visual about that. So I much. hope you guys do too. Because yeah. we're here to teach you things. Huh? <laughs> So that is the end of the story of Alexander Pierce. How, how are we feeling about Ooh, that? <laughs> that was one of the most suspenseful stories I think we've ever the, the covered. Tension. Oh my god. The entire time I was researching this, all I could think about was how the entire thing really did play out like a movie. Because it's hard to believe this happened. We've seen cases like this throughout history. And it honestly, this shows the lengths someone will go through 
just to survive. And at the sound of being morbid and sounding like Hannibal Lecter, cannibalism, at, at least to my weird ass, I think it's a fascinating subject. Right. In the context of this story, it's the, the terrifying cherry on top of the horror cake. Not only did these men suffer absolute hell from mostly petty crimes, they were forced to do unspeakable things just to survive. I think the first escape broke Alexander Pierce, and I think Thomas Cox suffered his fate because of it. I, I Maybe we'll have to do a little episode on cannibalism in the future because there's it's such a cool topic. We've covered a few cannibals. Like, I mean, we have Catherine Knight. We've yeah, done a few. but like Pee-wee claimed he did. Pee-wee, yeah, we, we don't but, believe you know, much. Don't of, know you know what? That. Like, if you guys want more of these kind of cannibal-based episodes, let us know because <laughs> we got a list now. Like, goddamn. We really hope you guys like this one. I know I did. So now, a moment ago, we spoke about how horrifying early medicine was. Next week, we'll be diving into that a little bit more, not with cannibalism, but with a case that honestly might make you want to throw up in your mouth a little bit. Oh, it's so gross. Stay tuned. If you are on our Patreon, then you already saw the sneak peek, and we hope you're excited for us to gross you out. Yeah, because it's going to be a bit rough in that department. Yeah, and speaking of Patreon, check out our Patreon. We are going to be releasing a special Christmas-themed episode for our monthly bedtime stories, and we also have a ton of content there for you guys already, including our behind-the-scenes videos and you know, all the other fun stuff. We also recently lowered the cost of our Grim Cinephile tier, which gives you access to our movie nights, and our Grim Patron of the Arts tier, which means you get a special little package from us once a month and a bunch of other good stuff. We know we mention it a lot, but it is a great way to support the podcast and help us grow. You can join it for as little as three bucks, and that's www.patreon.com slash thegrimcurriculum. Until then, make sure you don't miss out on The Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at The Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. We are also on TikTok and Facebook, so you can look us up there. And we are available on all podcast platforms except Apple. If you are someone who listens to us on Spotify, please, please, please give us a five-star rating. That helps us please those algorithm gods. And okay, apparently uh, some of you were having trouble finding us on Spotify and we finally figured it out. It's stupid. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) If you look us up on Spotify and you don't find us, it's because you need to scroll all the way down to the podcast section and then you will see nothing but us. I know it sounds silly, but I've had a few people uh, message me to tell me that they actually can't find us, and I couldn't figure out why for the longest time, and you gotta just scroll. And honestly, guys, if you can't find us, just message us on social media, and we'll make sure you get the right links to the right places. And you can always go to our link tree, which yeah. is in, like, all of our bios it's and got, stuff. It's, it's got all there. all the things We, we try, there. try to make it easy for you guys yeah. to find us and listen to us. Absolutely. You can also find us individually on social media. We're going to link our personal socials down below, along with some other fun stuff. Thanks for listening. This has been The, the Grim, Grim Curriculum. Curriculum. All right, listen here, I am willing to bet at this point you're probably sitting down in your chair or your car and you're hunched over like a human croissant. So stretch out, grab some water, and settle in for another episode, you delicious-looking human pastry. Bye. Bye.